Open your Bibles, if you would, to 1 John. We are going to continue our Walking with God series. And uh, as we as we do this, as we walk with God, there are some things that we need to know about spiritual maturity. First John, I, I just I, it's a wonderful book. There's so much here. My wife tells me it's one of her favorite, uh, one of the favorite her favorite series, I guess, that I've been going through. And and uh, I don't know, I, I I love the book. The uh, the epistle of John is is really near and dear to my heart. And so we can learn a lot from what we see here. We're going to talk tonight about loving the Christians. Loving the Christians. And we're going to mainly be in verses uh, 9, 10, and 11. We covered seven, verses 7 and 8 a couple weeks ago. And so tonight's not going to be a lengthy message, but I, I feel like it's going to, I hope, prick your heart. I love a good message that challenges me. I love a good message that is, that's convicting. You want to know why? Because I believe that's the Holy Spirit of God talking to my soul that I need to grow. So tonight we're going to talk about loving the Christians. You know, this is really a hard issue. This is really a hard issue. It's not only a hard issue, it's a heart issue. Sometimes it's easier to love the non-Christian than it is the Christian. It, it, it amazes me that, that somebody who we have so much in common with, we're going to spend an eternity fellowshipping in the presence of God in heaven forever with. We just can't seem to get along here on earth. Now, it is amazing to me that the, Christ, that the non-Christian, the, the, the God-hating heathen, the, the, the rebel, the, the person out there who just does not want anything to do with God, it's easy for a Christian to get along with them. Well, Christians, they, they just, they just kind of, sometimes, sometimes Christians kind of flock to that group of people. You see, it should be easier for us to get along with people we are more in tune with, Right? I don't know, the more that uh, my wife and I uh, know each other and grow together, the more we become so much more alike, the more that, that she does everything I want her to do. <laughs> that's, not, that's not totally true. But it, 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 the point is this, the point is this, is, is we spend so much time together, we just, we, we start to think like each other. Is it raining in here? We start to think like each other. We, she, she can actually anticipate my needs. We are, we are so much alike. I walked into the kitchen tonight, and uh, I, just, I just, you know, kind of looked out on my periphery, and I for the coffee, and I didn't say the word coffee. I didn't say, wow, it smells like coffee in here. I didn't say the word filter. I didn't say the word uh, beans. I just, I just, I didn't, there was no hint. I just looked over there, and she says, you want me to make some coffee? And I said, yeah, I would, actually, I'd, I'd like that. We get to know each other so well. We get to we get to anticipate our, 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 what, what each other needs. And that is really refreshing. Because you go out in the world and you talk with non-Christians out there. You talk with a group of unsaved people that are, that are absolutely just as worldly as can be. And they, they, they can't anticipate your needs. But why is it easier to get along with them than it is the people in your own house? The goal for the Christian should always be spiritual growth should always be spiritual growth. And of course, when we talk spiritual growth, we're talking Christ-likeness. Our goal is to be conformed into the image of his son. We are supposed to look like Christ. Now, that's, a, that, that's big, right? That, that's big. We know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. We know that one day we are going to look just like our heavenly father. Isn't that cool? It's from, a, from a very young age, Everybody would look at Ben and say, boy, you are your, 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 your father's son. He looks just so, so much like me. Now, he's not as good looking as I am, but he's pretty good looking. And uh, one day we are going to look exactly like our heavenly father. Isn't that neat? 
The goal for the Christian should always be spiritual growth. And as a matter of fact, that's the theme of this year, isn't it? Growth 2020. So that's our goal this year is to grow. Let's grow spiritually. Many Christians have the form of godliness, but they deny the power thereof. They, they maybe look like a Christian ought to look. I mean, let's face it. The Pharisees look like Christians ought to look. The, 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 the Sanhedrin looked like Christians ought to look. When you looked at their life, man, you said, there's not a spot or blemish, but yet they were all hypocrites, right? So in effect, they look like a lot of Christians look, I suppose. So you've got the Christians that kind of have that form of godliness. I think there's Christians out there that, that are really misled on what a Christian really is supposed to look like. I think some people think that, you know, because I go to church, that's what a Christian looks like. Because I read my Bible, well, that's what a Christian looks like. There's a lot, unfortunately, there's a lot of Christians out there who aren't going to church, and they're not reading their Bible, and they're not praying. So ironically, that is what most people think a Christian looks like. But we need to grow up, and growing up doesn't just mean getting older, it means to mature. How do we become more mature? Mature in our Christian life. Maturity is really what you want. You want somebody who has uh, levels of maturity. So let's look at one aspect of what a mature Christian should look like. This is what a mature Christian should look like. And I'm going to back all the way up. I'm going to go up to verse 1 of chapter 2, and I'm just going to kind of give you the context right now, okay? Uh, 1 John 2, 1, my little children, these things write I unto you that you sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he is the propitiation for our sin, and not ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. And hereby we do know that we know him if we keep his commandments. He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoso keepeth his word, in him verily is the love of God perfected. Hereby know we that we are in him. He that saith, he abideth in him, ought himself also so to walk, even as he walked. Brethren, I write no new commandment unto you. These are the two verses we covered a couple weeks ago, verse 7 and 8. Brethren, I write no new commandment unto you, but an old commandment which ye had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word which ye had heard from the beginning. Again, a new commandment I write unto you, which thing is true in him and in you, because the darkness is past and the true light now shineth. Now, picking up in verse 9. He that saith he is in the light and hateth his brother is in darkness even until now. Let me just stop there for a second. First of all, I want to say this, that hatred equals darkness. Hatred equals darkness. Now, while it's important to love all men, it's important to love all men, what John is talking about here is, is Christians loving Christians. This is what he has in mind. And of course, John is not referring to, to a loss of salvation or disingenuous faith in, if, in fact, you don't have love one for another. That's not what he's talking about here. Because if hate were a sign of unbelief, then none of us would ever be saved. None of us would ever be saved. Now, there are a lot of people that say, well, if you hate your brother, you're probably not saved. This is the this is the, the, the no fruit, no root, right, kind of mentality. This is, listen, if you're not living it, uh, you're not saved. But that's not what this verse is talking about. This is talking to Christians about how to grow as a Christian. This is, what's hap this is the context of verses 3 to 11. 3 to 11. It, it deals with the Christian life and what follows spiritual infancy. This is what follows spiritual infancy. And here's what he says. He says that he that saith he is in the light and hateth his brother is in darkness even until now. There is a, a special path for spiritual maturity, isn't there? Special path. Keep your finger there and go to John chapter 15. Go to John chapter 15. The spiritual path to maturity has everything to do with abiding. It has everything to do with abiding. 
in John chapter 15. We'll look at the first six verses. I am the true vine, and my father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away, and every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Here it is, verse 4, ready? Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine. No more can ye, except ye abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. The path of spiritual maturity really begins with abiding in Jesus Christ. If you are not abiding in Jesus Christ, you will not, you will not have a, a fruitful life. If you want to grow in Christ, you have to abide in Christ. There's a lot of people that say, well, well I, I, you know, I read my Bible, and I, and, I, and, I, and I study it a lot. And they say, uh, they say, they say, I really have, I, I really understand this. And and I, and and to me, I just say, man, it's not about you getting hold of the passage. It's about the passage getting hold of you. It's about when that works in your life. It's about it's about the the word of God that lives and abides forever, affecting you spiritually to grow. It, it's about when it gets a hold of you. You ever get those, those, uh, those verses, those passages that you read, and it's just, it's, it's just overly convicting, you know? Where it's kind of the showstopper in your devotions. When you read it, and you're like, oh, man, I got to work on that. And you sit there, and you begin to pray. You know what happened in that very, very moment? That passage just got a hold of you. It's when it's that moment of abiding, when you begin to abide in God, in the vine, when you say, Lord, I get this, he says, then it's going to be reciprocal. You're going to abide in him, he's going to abide in you. You see, this verse is dealing with the person who is in spiritual darkness or infancy. That's what this passage is dealing with. The person, the brother, the Christian who's hating another Christian. And I tell you what, there's a lot of that in the church, isn't there? It's unfortunate. There's a lot of that in the church. I don't think it's a lot in this church, but a lot in the, in the universal church as a whole, Christian hating Christian. Once again, why is it we can get along with the world, but we can't get along with our brother in Christ? That should be the easy one. There's so many similarities. There's so much likeness. If you're trying to look like Christ and he's trying to look like Christ, you kind of look like each other. And you wonder why in the world you hate this guy so much. Probably because he looks a lot like you. And you don't like the way you look. Let me say this, though, that everybody has to start from somewhere, so have grace with everyone, right? Well, I tell you, the, the Christian out there, the, 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 the young infant, the guy who just gets saved and gets excited and is burdened, and, uh, boy, has all sorts of things to overcome in his life. Sometimes we're not very gracious with that guy, are we? And sometimes we're more gracious with that guy than the person who knows what to do and doesn't do it. In John 13, 34, we looked at this a couple weeks ago, a new commandment I give unto you that ye love one another as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. Now, friends, we need, to, we need to love the unsaved, right? We need to love those unsaved people out there. The Bible says, for God so loved the world. I think that's the unsaved because it goes on to say that he gave his life for those people, right? God loves the unsaved. I think we should love the unsaved. But we need to love the saved as well. This is a sign Hate is a sign of immaturity. Hate is a sign of immaturity. Here's the litmus test for you. Here's the litmus test for you. You need to check your hateometer. <laughs> How much am I hating other Christians out there? How much am I hating other Christians out there? Because if you're hating other Christians out there, you're in darkness even until now. It, it doesn't mean you're unsaved, it just means you're in darkness. 
It means there's not a, a, a spirit, spiritual light in your life. You're, you're in a state of infancy. Well, you can, you can tell when, when, when I see, when I'm out there and I see a Christian that does another Christian wrong, and the one Christian that had wrong done to him, they just rejoice exceedingly and say, man, I'm going to forgive that guy. I love that guy. Man, praise God, you know. I mean, he, he doesn't even know what he does. I mean, he's ignorant. I mean, the Lord forgave ignorance in a sense, didn't he? Now he commands every man everywhere to repent. But I'm saying, like, when he was, stand, when he was hanging on that cross, forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do. You know? And if we're to resemble Christ's likeness, don't we think, we should, hey, this guy's, a, this guy's a young Christian, or maybe this guy's an old Christian. I don't know. Maybe he's been a Christian for a long time, but we need to forgive that person, and we need to have grace with that person. We need to check our hate meter Do you love the brethren, or do you not? I think reactions are also part of spiritual maturity. I think reactions also, are, they, they, they really tell where you're at. Is, the, are, is, a, is it a response or is it a reaction? And there's a difference. Responses are kind of like the plan, like, hey, if I ever get done, by, or done wrong by somebody, I'm just going to forgive them, I'm going to love them. I'm gonna just going to exude grace. Yeah, they, they, they've sinned, but you know what? Where, where sin abounds, grace is that much more abounds. So I'm just going to love them. And, and I tell you, sometimes that's hard, especially coming from somebody who knows what they're doing wrong, right? Give less grace for those people for some reason. It's running rampant in the church, this hatred for Christians. Hatred proves that you're in darkness and not in fellowship with Christ. People out there who, who, hate, who hate other Christians, they say they're not in fellowship with Christ. Because if you hate, you're in darkness even until now. And if Christ is in the light all the time, then you are in darkness. Therefore, you're not in fellowship with him. People say, I've got a great relationship with God. Man, I love God. And, and I just we, we just, we have just times of wonderful intimacy. And we're always excited to spend time with, the God, with each other. I, God loves spending time with me. I love spending time with God. And, and I'm walking in the light. And then the next moment, they're hating their brother. Can I tell you that they're wrong? They're walking in darkness even until now. Ephesians 5, 8, For you were sometimes darkness, but now are you light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. Walk as children of light. There is a way that a Christian should walk, right? A way that a Christian should walk. I mean, I'm not talking, you know, walk, you know. I'm talking spiritually walk. There's a way he should walk. He should walk as children of light. So number one, hatred equals darkness. Uh, number two, number two is love equals light. Love equals light. He goes on in verse uh, verse ten. So flip back over to First John. Go to chapter two again, and look at verse ten. He that loveth his brother abideth in the light, and there is none occasion of stumbling in him. So love equals light. The person that loves his brother is not only in the light, but that's where he abides. He abides. He resides in the light. And can I say this, that there's none occasion of stumbling, which just simply means that, that he hasn't set a trap for himself, right? He has not set a, a trap for himself. When a Christian brother hates another Christian brother, they set themselves up for a big, big failure because those that are in darkness will stumble and they will fall. I don't know how many of you have been in darkness before where it's been just so pitch black. We just recently hung these, these blankets over our windows. Kind of feel like a, I don't know, I feel kind of weird saying that, but we hung, hung blankets. It just gets so light, doesn't it? At, at, at 5 o'clock in the morning, I, I plan on waking up anyway, but you know what, I don't want to wake up a minute early. You know, so I want to sleep as long as I can until I can. But I tell you what, the, the, the sun just comes pouring in, so we hang these, these uh, blankets or something, I don't know what they are, over the windows, and it is pitch black. I'm telling you, you can't see anything in that room. You can't see anything. And, they're all, and, you, you're, and then I have the fan on, right, because that gives me my white noise. How many of you sleep with white noise with a fan? Yeah, you all right. 
I like it. So you turn this fan on and you get the little. Sometimes it touches the bed and then it kind of. And Dana kind of nudges me. He's like, is the fan touching the bed? <laughs> anyway, so. <laughs> that was for free. So we hang these blankets over the window and uh, we turn the fan on. And, and, and I tell you, if, if you were to do like a quarter turn in that room, you are, you are totally, uh, you just need something to calibrate, right? So you grab, you don't touch the wall in my house. So you grab, the, you grab the edge of the bed and you're like, that's the mattress, all right. And then you lay down and you open your eyes and you could swear your eyes are closed. That's how dark it is. There's not one lumen in that entire bedroom. Nothing, nothing, pitch black. And if you get up in the middle of the night when it's dark, that dark, you will stumble. It, it, it is amazing. I mean, God was right. I mean, God was right. You will stumble in darkness. And that's what happens when a Christian brother hates a Christian brother. But when it's light, there's none occasion of stumbling. Because you see what's in front of you. One commentator said this. This does not mean, of course, that the person is sinless, but rather... That in so walking as Christ walked, we, that was back in verse 6, he lays no trap for himself. That is, he does not create the inner spiritual condition by which he can be trapped and ensnared to sin. 1 John 4, 20 to 21 says, If a man say, I love God and hateth his brother, he is a liar. And there are a lot of Christians that do this. Say, I love God, and then you, you have grievance against your brother. Like, I hate this guy over here, though. He did me wrong. For he that loveth not his brother whom he hath seen, how can he live God? Uh, how can he love God whom he hath not seen? So how can you love God who's invisible when you can't even love your brother who is visible? You're willing to trust something you cannot see, and you're not willing to, to, to enjoy, to trust, to love the one that you can see. How can you love your brother more? You know, we can all grow in loving the one that's done us wrong. We can all grow in loving our brother. A believer who walks like Jesus walked should also love like Jesus loves. And abiding in love helps us to mature spiritually. You know what? When you see another Christian that loves another Christian, it's, you can instantly gauge spirituality. They say, well, how, how can you know somebody is, is, is spiritual just by looking at them? Just look at the way they interact and how much they love their brother. Because if they don't love their brother, they're in darkness. And if they do, they're spiritually mature or they are in the process of maturing. They're growing in Christ. So love equals light. Thirdly, darkness equals blindness. Darkness equals blindness. And that's from verse 11, 1 John 2, 11. But he that hateth his brother is in darkness and walketh in darkness and knoweth not whither he goeth because that darkness, darkness hath blinded his eyes. Now, not only is the hater in darkness, but it's where he lives. So the one who loves abides in the light. And this person, the one who hateth his brother, he's the one who, in a sense, abides in darkness. You see, the dark path is always the dangerous, is always a dangerous place. You never want to be in a dark place. Uh, there are some people who are afraid of the dark. Don't raise your hand. How many are afraid of the dark? Don't raise your hand. Rhetorical question. How many are afraid of the dark? Seriously. All right. So you're trying to raise your wife's hand. Now you're going to be afraid of the dark. <laughs> She's got me by the throat again. <laughs> Boy, you did yourself in. It's always, it's always a scary place to be. I mean, listen, nobody wants to be in a dark alley, especially if you hear the pumping of a shotgun. That's definitely not a place you want to be. Nobody wants to be buried alive, right? Nobody wants to be in... Now, that's also... I mean, 
Uh, I'm just thinking of like claustrophobia. That'd be bad too. Well, it's a double whammy. Not only is it dark, but it's enclosed. Bad news. Even elevators, when the lights go out in an elevator, that'd be bad news, especially if you're in Israel because the elevators are only this big. <laughs> and those of you who've been to Israel know exactly what I'm talking about. You know they're small when you have to send your luggage up before you can get on. <laughs> it's true, though. It's true. I wonder why they make them so small. Because there's no personal space? Yeah, maybe. Yeah, I guess as Americans, we're just we're territorial, kind of. Just We need our space, maybe. Anyway, I don't know. It's always dangerous. It's always a scary place to be. When you are in darkness, you're blind. Nobody likes that. Nobody likes it when they can't see. We all like to see. We all like to see in front of us, around us. But this is what happens when we live in darkness. We become blind, and darkness always will lead to stumbling. You always trip over something. You walk through the, the, the living room, and it's dark, and you stub your toe. Right? How many of you have kids and have stepped on a dumb Lego? How many of you don't have kids and have stepped on a Lego? <laughs> they just show up. I don't understand it. You don't even have to have Legos, and there'll be a Lego. <laughs> you know, but one thing's true about a Lego. You know it was a Lego. Because they got these really sharp corners on them. They're just horrible. Got this little imprint of a Lego on your... Or a little Lego guy. <laughs> Darkness always leads to stumbling. You know, I tell you, you need to love your, you need to love your brother. I wish there was more love and unity among the brethren. I wish a Christian can look at another Christian and just get over it. There, there's just not enough time in the day. There's not enough people in the universe. Just get along, right? Is that, is that okay? To, can we just get along? You know, it's, it's amazing growing up. I, actually, I didn't grow up. Dana grew up in the Baptist circle. But you know, people always talked about... Uh, you know, the levels of ecumenicalism. You, know, you, just don't, you just don't get along with everybody. Well, I didn't say you have to believe what everybody else believes, but you can at least get along with them, right? I mean, I'm not Catholic. I grew up Catholic. I'm not Catholic, but if a priest sticks his hand out to shake my hand, I'm going to shake his hand. If, if, if there's a Christian out there that does, that does me wrong, that does something that I don't approve of, I'm still going to try to get along with them. You go out of your way, you shake their hand, and you say, I love you, brother. Hopefully you're doing well. Right? And you mean it when you say it. You just try to get along. Now, I know that's just a cliche. Can't we all just get along? But the reality is a Christian should get along with a Christian. And that is a sign of spiritual maturity. When you can put your grievances past you and say, good to see you, brother. And talk spiritual things with them and love on them. And you know what? They might rail on you and they might talk negative and and, 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 and say all manner of things falsely against you. But it's when you say, man, I just love you. Now I'm going to keep loving you. I'm just going to keep, keep praying for you. And then you don't turn your back on them and go say a bunch of negative things, but you get excited. You say, man, I just, man, I just had this encounter, and, and man, we can just keep loving them. And we should be able to love the people who we are so much like. This is a sign of spiritual maturity. And if not, you're lying. If you say that you love God, and you hate your brother, you're in spiritual darkness. And you need to get right before God. I think there's a lot of people that just need to get right before God and need to have an encounter with him and say, Lord, you know what? I'm just not the guy that I ought to be. There's people I've got some grievances against, and I'm holding some grudges. We talked about bitterness, I don't know, about a month ago. And they just need to get beyond it, right? Love your brother. This is a sign of spiritual maturity. And when somebody says, man, I can't stand this guy. I, this, I don't like this guy. I hate this guy. Well, that tells me where you're at spiritually. And it's time to mature. We need to love our fellow Christians. So darkness equals blindness. Darkness equals blindness. What's the way that we can have the, the most light then, right? How can we have the eyes of our understanding be enlightened? Well, first of all, we've got to get saved. We've got to know Jesus Christ as our Savior. That's, that's the key, I mean, really, to all of this. 
Because the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. It's foolishness to him. So you get a guy out there who says, I just don't get it. You won't get it until you get saved. And then you'll begin to get it. You have to have the Holy Spirit who guides us and teaches us all things. You need the Holy Spirit in your life to help you understand the Bible. That's what you need. And that begins by you trusting Christ as your Savior. And it's when you, in the quietness of your own mind, believe Jesus died, buried, and was rose again the third day. You know, I'm so glad that he didn't make it hard for us, you know? Can you imagine? God says, you got to jump through all these herbs. What, you know, what if he says, you got to go to church to be saved, to go to heaven? And you don't have a church? <laughs> he says, you got to get baptized. And there's no water. And he says, you got to give money, but you're broke. You know, you got to jump through all these things. You got you to turn from all your sin or all your known sin. Well, I don't know all my sin. I don't know what to do. You know what he says? He says that faith alone. That's what it is. It's faith alone. For by grace are you saved through faith. That's just wonderful. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. Praise God that's not of myself. Because I wouldn't know how often I get baptized, how much money to give, what church to attend. I'd be so confused. I'd be like, Lord, I don't know. I did all of these things. But you know what he says? He says, the wages of sin is death. Someone has to die for your sin. And 2,000 years ago, Jesus Christ died for your sin. The wages of sin is death, not church membership. I suppose the church would have more money. We might have more members. We, we might have a, a wet baptistry every Sunday if I just said, dude, all you got to do is you just got to get baptized. You got to give money. You got to join a church, right? You join this church you're in. You might be bigger. You might be smaller. You never know. <laughs> if I slicked my hair back and had some, had some drums up here, Brooks, maybe we get some drums up here. <laughs> maybe get a wrapper maybe loosen my tie a little bit I'm so thankful that salvation is something that God gives to me because of what I believe not because of what I do and if you're here tonight you don't know Christ as your savior believe that he is the son of God he died for your sins was buried and rose again the third day you go to heaven 